Thank you, Mr. Smith. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A specter is haunting America, the specter of religion. This, borrowing Karl Marx's literary style, is my theme tonight. Where do I see religion? The outstanding political fact of the 1980s, in my judgment, is the rise of the new right and its penetration of the Republican Party under President Reagan. The bulk of the new right, as you know, consists of Protestant fundamentalists typified by the moral majority. These men are frequently allied on basic issues with other religiously oriented groups, including conservative Catholics of the William F. Buckley ilk and neoconservative Jewish intellectuals of the commentary magazine variety. All these groups observed the behavior of the new left a while back and concluded, understandably enough, that the country was perishing. They saw the liberals' idealization of drugged hippies and nihilistic yippies. They saw the proliferation of pornography, of sexual perversion, of noisy lib and power groups running to the Democrats to demand ever more outrageous handouts and quotas. They heard the routine leftist deprecation of the United States and the routine counsel to appease Soviet Russia, and they concluded, with good reason, that what the country was perishing from was a lack of values, of ethical absolutes, of morality. Values, the left retorted, are subjective. No lifestyle and no country is better or worse than any other. There is no absolute right or wrong anymore, they said, unless, the liberals added, you believe in some outmoded ideology like religion. Precisely, the new rightists reply. That is our whole point. There are absolute truths and absolute values, they say which are the key to the salvation of our great country. But there is only one source of such values, not man or this earth or the human brain, but the deity as revealed in scripture. The choice we face, they conclude, is the skepticism, decadence, and statism of the Democrats, or morality, absolutes, Americanism, and their only possible base, religion, old-time Judeo-Christian religion. Here's Mr. Reagan in 1980, quote, Religious America is awakening, perhaps just in time for our country's sake. In a struggle against totalitarian tyranny, traditional values based on religious morality are among our greatest strengths, unquote. Here's Jack Kemp, quote, Religious views lie at the heart of our political system. The inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are based on the belief that each individual is created by God and has a special value in his eyes. Without a common belief in the one God who created us, there could be no freedom and no recourse if a majority were to seek to abrogate the rights of the minority." Unquote. Or as Education Secretary Bennett sums up this viewpoint, quote, our values as a free people and the central values of the Judeo-Christian tradition are flesh of the flesh and blood of the blood, unquote. Now politicians in America have characteristically given lip service to the platitudes of piety, but the new right is different. These men seem to mean their religiosity and they are dedicated to implementing their religious creeds politically. They seek to make these creeds the governing factor in the realm of our personal relations, our art and literature, our clinics and hospitals, and the education of our youth. Whatever else you say about him, Mr. Reagan has delivered handsomely on one of his campaign promises. He has given the adherence of religion <clears throat> a prominence in setting the national agenda that they have not had in this country for generations. 
This defines our subject for tonight. It is the new Republican inspiration and the deeper questions it raises. Is the new right the answer to the new left? What is the relation between the Judeo-Christian tradition and the principles of Americanism? Are Ronald Reagan and Jack Kemp, as their admirers declare, leading us to a new era of freedom and capitalism or to something else? In discussing these issues, I am not going to talk much about the new right as such. <clears throat> its specific beliefs are widely known. Instead, I want to examine the movement within a broader philosophical context. I want to ask, what is religion? And then, how does it function in the life of a nation, any nation, past or present? <clears throat> to be sure, these are very abstract questions, but they are inescapable. Only when we have considered them can we go on to judge the relation between a particular religion, such as Christianity, and a particular nation, such as America. Let us begin then with a definition. Let us ask, what is religion as such? What is the essence common to all its varieties, Western and Oriental, which distinguishes the phenomenon from other cultural manifestations? In a general way, we may answer, religion involves a certain kind of outlook on the world and a consequent way of life. In other words, religion is a type of philosophy. And as such, a religion must include a view of knowledge, which is the subject matter of the branch of philosophy called epistemology. And it must include a view of reality, which is covered by metaphysics. And then on this foundation, a religion builds a view of values, and that is its ethics or morality. So the question becomes, what kind of philosophy constitutes a religion? The Oxford English Dictionary defines religion as a particular system of faith and worship, and goes on in part, or quote just part, recognition on the part of man of some higher unseen power as having control of his destiny and as being entitled to obedience, reverence, and worship, unquote. The fundamental concept here is faith. Faith in this context means belief in the absence of evidence. This is the essential that distinguishes religion from science. A scientist may believe in entities which he cannot observe, such as atoms or electrons, but he can do so only if he proves their existence logically by inference from the things he does observe. A religious man, however, believes in some higher unseen power which he cannot observe and cannot logically prove. As the whole history of philosophy demonstrates, no study of the natural universe can warrant jumping outside it to a supernatural entity. The five arguments for God offered by the greatest of all religious thinkers, Thomas Aquinas, are widely recognized by philosophers to be logically defective. They have each been refuted many times, and they are the best arguments that have ever been offered on this subject. Many philosophers indeed now go further. They point out that God not only is an article of faith, but that this is essential to religion. A God susceptible of proof, they argue, would actually wreck religion. A God open to human logic, to scientific study, to rational understanding, they note, such a God would have to be definable, delimited, finite, amenable to human concepts, obedient to scientific law, and thus incapable of miracles. Such a thing would be merely one object among others within the natural world. It would be merely another datum for the scientists, like some new kind of galaxy or cosmic ray, not a transcendent power running the universe and demanding man's worship. What religion rests on, they conclude, is a true God, i.e., a God not of reason, but of faith. If you want to concretize the idea of faith, 
I suggest that you visit, of all places, the campuses of the Ivy League. <laughs> where, according to the New York Times, a religious revival is now occurring. Will you find students busily discussing proofs or struggling to reinterpret the ancient myths of the Bible into some kind of consistency with the teachings of science? On the contrary, the students, like their parents, are insisting that the Bible be accepted as literal truth, whether it makes logical sense or not. I quote from one campus religious official, quoted in the Times, quote, Students today are more reconciled to authority. There is less need for students to sit on their own mountaintop, unquote. In other words, to exercise their own independent minds and judgment. Why not? They are content simply to believe. At Columbia, for instance, a new student group gathers regularly on campus, not to analyze, but, quote, to sing, worship, and speak in tongues. <laughs> Here is a chaplain at Columbia, quote, people are coming back to religion in a way that some of us once went to the counterculture, unquote. Absolutely true. And note what they are coming back to. Not reason or logic, but faith. Faith names the method of religion, the essence of its epistemology. And as the Oxford English Dictionary states, the belief in some higher unseen power is the basic content of religion its distinctive view of reality, its metaphysics. This higher power is not always conceived as a personal god. Some religions construe it as an impersonal dimension of some kind. The common denominator is the belief in the supernatural, in some entity, attribute, or force, transcending and controlling this world in which we live. According to religion, this supernatural power is the essence of the universe and the source of all value. It is the realm of true reality and of absolute perfection. By contrast, the world around us is viewed as only semi-real and as inherently imperfect, even corrupt, in any event metaphysically unimportant. According to most religions, this life is a mere episode in the soul's journey to its ultimate fulfillment which involves leaving behind earthly things in order to unite with deity. As a pamphlet issued by a Catholic information group expresses this point, man, quote, cannot achieve perfection or true happiness in his life here on earth. He can only achieve this in the eternity of the next life after death. Therefore, what a person has or lacks in terms of worldly possessions, privileges, or advantages is not important, unquote. In New Delhi a few months ago, expressing this viewpoint, Pope John Paul II urged on the Indians a life of asceticism and renunciation. <laughs> Unquote. In Quebec sometime earlier, he decried, quote, the fascination the modern word, the world feels for productivity, profit, efficiency, speed, and records of physical strength, unquote. <laughs> Too many men, he explained in Luxembourg, quote, consciously organized their way of life merely on the basis of the realities of this world without any heed for God and his wishes, unquote. <laughs> Which brings us to religious ethics, the essence of which also involves faith, faith in God's commandments. Virtue in this view is obedience. It is not a matter of achieving your desires, whatever they may be, but of seeking to carry out God's. It is not the pursuit of egoistic goals, whether rational or not, but the willingness to renounce your own goals in the service of the Lord. In other words, what religion counsels is the ethics of self-transcendence, self-abnegation, self-sacrifice. <clears throat> What single attitude most stands in the way of this ethics, according to religious writers? 
the sin of pride. Why is pride a sin? Because man in this view is a metaphysically defective creature. His intellect is helpless in the crucial questions of life. His will has no real power over his existence, which is ultimately controlled by God. His body lusts with all the temptations of the flesh. In short, man is weak, ugly, and low. A typical product of the low, unreal world in which he lives. Your proper attitude toward yourself, therefore, as to this world, should be a negative one. For creatures such as you and I, honest means humility, self-castigation, even self-disgust. <laughs> so we can sum up so far, religion in essence means orienting one's existence around faith, God, and a life of service, and correspondingly of downgrading or openly condemning four key elements, reason, nature, the self, and man. You see that religion cannot be equated with morality or values or even philosophy as such. It represents a specific kind of philosophy with its own specific code of morality. Now our question is, what effect does this kind of philosophy have on human life? We don't have to answer by theoretical deduction because Western history has been a succession of religious and unreligious periods. And the modern world, including America, is a product of two of these periods, of Greek or Roman civilization and of medieval Christianity. So to enable us to understand America, let us first look at the historical evidence from these two periods. Let us look at their views on religion and at the practical consequences of these views. Then we will have no trouble grasping the base and essence of the United States. Ancient Greece was not a religious civilization, not on any of the counts we mentioned. The gods of Mount Olympus were like a race of elder brothers to man, mischievous brothers with rather limited powers. They were closer to E.T. Than, than to anything we would call God. They did not create the universe or shape its laws or leave any message of revelations or demand a life of sacrifice. Nor, in fact, were they taken very seriously by the leading voices of the culture, such as Plato and Aristotle. From start to finish, the Greek thinkers recognized no sacred texts, no infallible priesthood, no intellectual authority beyond the human mind. In other words, they allowed no room for faith. Epistemologically, most were staunch individualists who expected each man to grasp the truth by his own power of observation and logical thought. For details, I refer you to Aristotle, the preeminent representative of the Greek spirit. Metaphysically, as a result, Greece was a secular culture. Men generally dismissed or downplayed the supernatural. Their energies were devoted to the joys and challenges of life. There was a shadowy belief in immortality, but the dominant attitude to it was summed up by Homer, who has Achilles declare that he would rather be a slave on earth than, quote, bear sway among all the dead that be departed, unquote. <laughs> As to Greek ethics, it followed from this base. All the Greek thinkers agreed that virtue is egoistic. The purpose of morality, in their view, is to enable a man to achieve his own fulfillment, his own happiness, by means of a proper development of his natural faculties, above all, his cognitive faculty, his intellect. <clears throat> and as to the Greek estimate of man, look at the statues of the Greek gods, made in the image of human strength, human grace, human beauty. And read Aristotle's account of the virtue, yes, the virtue of pride. I must add here that in many ways, Plato was an exception to the general irreligion of the Greeks. But he was not dominant until much later. When his spirit did take over, the Greek approach by that fact had already died out. 
what replaced it was the era of Christianity. The Middle Ages, intellectually speaking, were the exact opposite of Greece. The leading philosophic spokesman of the time, Augustine, stated that faith was the basis of man's entire mental life. You know his famous aphorism, one must first believe in order that one may then know. In other words, reason is nothing but a handmaiden of theology. It is a mere adjunct of faith whose task is to clarify as far as possible the dogmas of religion. What if a dogma cannot be clarified? So much the better answered an earlier church father, Tertullian. The truly religious man, he said, delights in thwarting his reason because that shows his commitment to faith. Thus, Tertullian's famous answer when asked about the dogma of God's self-sacrifice on the cross, credo quia absurdum. I believe it because it is absurd. <clears throat> as to the realm of physical nature, the medievals characteristically regarded it as a semi-real haze. A transitory stage in the divine plan and a troublesome one at that. A delusion and a snare. A delusion because men mistake it for reality. A snare because they are tempted by its lures to jeopardize their immortal souls. What tempts them is the prospect of earthly pleasure. What kind of life then does the immortal soul require on earth? Self-denial, asceticism, the resolute shunning of this temptation. But isn't it unfair to ask man to throw away his whole enjoyment of life? The medieval answer is, what else befits creatures befouled by original sin? Creatures who are, in Augustine's words, quote, sordid and crooked, ulcerous and bespotted. Now, what were the practical results in the ancient world, then in the medieval, of these two opposite approaches to life? <clears throat> Greece created philosophy, logic, science, mathematics, and a magnificent man glorifying art. It gave us the base of modern civilization in every field. It taught the West how to think. In addition, through its admirers in ancient Rome, which built on the Greek intellectual base, Greece indirectly gave us the spectacle of the rule of law and the first idea of man's rights. This idea was originated by the pagan Stoics. Politically, the ancients never conceived a society of full-fledged individual liberty. No nation achieved that before the United States. But the ancients did lay certain theoretical bases for the concept of liberty, and in practice, both in some of the Greek city-states and in Republican Rome, large numbers of men at various times were at least comparatively free. They were incomparably more free than their counterparts ever had been in the religious cultures of ancient Egypt and its equivalents. Now, what were the practical results of the medieval approach? The Dark Ages were dark on principle. Augustine fought against secular philosophy, science, art. He regarded all of it as an abomination to be swept aside. He cursed science in particular as the lust of the eyes. In other words, unlike many Americans today, who drive to church in their Cadillac, <laughs> or take their favorite reverend on the VCR so as not to interrupt their tennis practice, Medievals took religion seriously. <laughs> they proceeded to create a society that was anti-materialistic and anti-intellectualistic. I do not, I assume, have to remind you of the lives of the saints, who were the heroes of the period, including the men who ate only sheep's gall and ashes, quenched their thirst with laundry water, and slept with a rock for their pillow. These were men resolutely denying, defying nature, the body, sex, pleasure, all the snares of this life. And they were canonized for it, as by the essence of religion they should have been. The 
economic and social results of this code of values were inevitable. Mass stagnation and abject poverty, ignorance and mass illiteracy, waves of insanity that swept whole towns, a life expectancy in the teens. Woe unto ye who laugh now, said the Sermon on the Mount. Well, they were pretty safe on this count. They had precious little to laugh about. <clears throat> what about freedom in this era? Study the existence of the feudal serf, tied for life to his plot of ground, his noble overlord, and the all-encompassing decrees of the church. Or if you want an example closer to home, jump several centuries forward to the American Puritans, who were a medieval remnant transplanted to a virgin continent, and who proceeded to establish a thoroughgoing theocratic dictatorship in colonial Massachusetts. Why did they? It was necessitated, they said, by the very nature of their religion. You are owned by God, they explained to any potential dissenter. Therefore, you are a servant who must act as your creator through his spokesman decrees. Besides, they said, you are innately depraved, so a dictatorship of the elect is necessary to ride herd on your vicious impulses. And they added, you don't really own your property either. Wealth, like all values, is a gift from heaven, temporarily held in trust, to be supervised, like all else, by the elect. And if all this makes you unhappy, they ended up, so what? You're not supposed to pursue happiness in this life anyway. In short, there can be no philosophic breach between thought and action. The consequence of the epistemology of religion is the politics of tyranny. If you cannot reach the truth by your own mental powers, but must be obedient to a cognitive authority, then you are not your own master, and you cannot guide your behavior by your own judgment either, but must be submissive in action as well. This is the reason why historically, as Ayn Rand often pointed out, faith and forth force are always corollaries. Each requires the other. Now I want to acknowledge here that the early Christians did contribute some good ideas to the world, ideas that proved important to the cause of future freedom. I must, so to speak, give the angels their due. <laughs> In particular, the idea that man has value as an individual, that the individual soul is precious, is essentially a Christian legacy to the West. Its first appearance was in the form of the idea that every man, despite original sin, is made in the image of God, as against the pre-Christian notion that a certain group or nation has a monopoly on human value, while the rest of mankind are properly slaves or mere barbarians. But notice one thing here. <clears throat> this Christian idea by itself was historically impotent. It did nothing to unshackle the serfs, or stay the Inquisition, or turn the Puritan elders into Thomas Jefferson. Only when the religious approach lost its power, only when the idea of individual value was able to break free from its initial Christian context and become integrated into a rational, secular philosophy, only then did this kind of idea bear practical fruit, as we are now going to see. <clears throat> and now let us ask what, or more exactly who, ended the Middle Ages? <clears throat> and my answer is Thomas Aquinas, who introduced Aristotle, and thereby reason, into medieval culture. In the 13th century, Aquinas, for the first time in a millennium, reasserted in the West the basic pagan approach. Reason, he said, in deliberate opposition to Augustine, reason does not rest on faith. It is a self-contained natural faculty which works on sense experience. And its essential task is not to clarify revelation, but rather, as Aristotle had said, to gain knowledge of this world. 
Man, Aquinas declared forthrightly, must use and obey reason. Whatever one can prove by reason and logic, he said, is true. Now, Aquinas himself thought that he could prove the existence of God. And he also thought that faith is often valuable as a supplement to reason. But this did not alter the nature of his revolution. His was the charter of liberty, the moral and philosophical sanction which the West had desperately needed. His message to mankind after the long ordeal of faith was, in effect, it's all right, you don't have to stifle your mind anymore, you can think. The result in historical short order was the revolt against the authority of the church, the feudal breakup, the Renaissance. Renaissance means rebirth, the rebirth of reason and of man's concern with this world. Once again, as in the pagan era, we see the rise of secular philosophy, natural science, man glorifying art, and the pursuit of earthly happiness. It was a gradual, tortuous change, each century becoming a little more worldly than the preceding, from Aquinas to the Renaissance to the Age of Reason to the climax and end of this development. The 18th century, the Age of Enlightenment. This was the age in which America's founding fathers were educated and in which they created the United States. The Enlightenment represented the triumph, for a short while anyway, of the pagan Greek, and specifically of the Aristotelian spirit. Its basic principle accordingly was respect for man's intellect, and correspondingly the wholesale dismissal of faith and revelation. Reason the only oracle of man, said Ethan Allen of Vermont, who spoke for his age, in demanding unfettered free thought and in ridiculing the primitive contradictions of the Bible. Here is a brief quote from him written in 1784. Quote, while we are under the tyranny of priests, it will ever be their interest to invalidate the law of nature and reason in order to establish systems incompatible therewith, unquote. Elihu Palmer, another American of the Enlightenment, was, if anything, even more outspoken. According to Christianity, he writes, God, quote, is supposed to be a fierce, revengeful tyrant, delighting in cruelty, punishing his creatures for the very sins which he causes them to commit, and creating numberless millions of immortal souls that could never have offended him for the express purpose of tormenting them to all eternity, unquote. <laughs> The purpose of this kind of notion, he says elsewhere, quote, the grand object of all civil and religious tyrants has been to suppress all the elevated operations of the mind, to kill the energy of thought, and through this channel to subjugate the whole earth for their own special emolument, unquote. Quote from him again, it has hitherto been deemed a crime to think Unquote. He observes, but at last men have a chance, he goes on, because they have finally escaped from, quote, the long and doleful night of Christian rule, and have grasped instead the unlimited power of human reason, reason which is the glory of our nature, unquote. Now, Allen and Palmer are extreme representatives of the Enlightenment attitude, I grant you, <clears throat> but they are representatives. Theirs is the attitude which was new in the modern world and which in a less inflammatory form was shared by all the founding fathers as their basic revolutionary premise. Thomas Jefferson states the attitude more sedately, with less willful provocation to religion, but it is the same essential attitude. Here is from a letter to a nephew of his, quote, Jefferson. Quote, fix reason firmly in her seat and call to her tribunal every fact, every opinion. Question with boldness even the existence of a God, because if there be one, he must more approve of the homage of reason than that of blindfolded fear, Unquote. Observe the philosophic priorities in this advice. Reason comes first, 
God is a derivative if you can prove it. The absolute which must guide the human mind is the principle of reason. Any other idea to be accepted must meet this test. It is in this approach, in this fundamental rejection of faith, that the irreligion of the Enlightenment intellectuals lies. The consequence of this approach was the age's rejection of all the other religious priorities. In metaphysics, this world once again was regarded as real, as important, as a realm not of miracles but of impersonal natural law. In ethics, success in this life became the dominant motive. The veneration of asceticism was swept aside in favor of each man's pursuit of happiness, his own happiness on earth, to be achieved by his own effort, by self-reliance and self-respect, leading to self-made prosperity. But can man really achieve fulfillment on earth? Yes, the Enlightenment answered. Man has the means, the potent faculty of intellect, necessary to achieve his goals and values. Man may not yet be perfect, it was said at the time, but he is perfectible. He must be so because he is the rational animal. Such were the watchwords of the period, not faith, God, service, but reason, nature, happiness, man. Many of the Founding Fathers, of course, continue to believe in God and to do so sincerely. But it was a vestigial belief, a leftover from the past, which no longer shaped the essence of their thinking. God, so to speak, had been kicked upstairs by the Enlightenment. <laughs> he was now regarded as a detached spectator who neither responds to prayer nor offers revelations, nor demands immolation. This sort of viewpoint is known as deism, and it cannot, properly speaking, be classified as a religion. It is a stage in the atrophy of religion. It is the step between Christianity and outright atheism. This is why the religious men of the Enlightenment, there were such, were scandalized and even panicked by the deist atmosphere. Here's the Reverend Peter Clark of Salem, Massachusetts, in 1739, quote, The former strictness in religion, that zeal for the order and ordinances of the gospel, which was so much the glory of our fathers, is very much abated, yes, disrelished by too many. And a spirit of licentiousness and neutrality in religion so opposite to the ways of God's people do exceedingly prevail in the midst of us." Unquote. And here, 50 years later, is the Reverend Charles Bacchus of Springfield, Massachusetts. The threat to divine religion, he says, is, quote, the indifference which prevails and the ridicule. Mankind, he warns, quote, are in great danger of being laughed out of religion, unquote. Now, this was true. These preachers were not alarmists. Their description of the Enlightenment atmosphere is correct. <clears throat> this was the intellectual context of the American Revolution. Point for point, <clears throat> the Founding Fathers' argument for liberty was the exact counterpart of the Puritans' argument for dictatorship, but in reverse moving from the opposite starting point to the opposite conclusion. Man, the Founding Fathers said in essence, of course with a large assist from John Locke and others, man, they said, is the rational being. No authority, human or otherwise, therefore can demand blind obedience from such a being. Not in the realm of thought, nor therefore in the realm of action either. By his very nature, they said, man must be left free to exercise his reason and then to act accordingly. In other words, on his own best rational judgment. Because this world is of vital importance, they added the goal of the action should be the pursuit of happiness. Because the individual, not a supernatural power, is the creator of wealth, a man should have the right to private property the right to keep and use his own product. 
And because man is basically good, they held, there is no need to leash him. There was nothing to fear in setting free a rational animal. This, in essence, was the American argument for man's inalienable rights. It was the argument that reason demands freedom. And this is why the nation of individual liberty, which is what the United States was, could not have been founded in any philosophically different century. It required what the Enlightenment offered, a rational, secular context. When you look for the basic source of a historic idea, you must consider philosophic essentials, not the superficial statements or errors that people may offer you. Even the most well-meaning men can misidentify the intellectual roots of their own attitudes. Regrettably, this in my judgment is what the Founding Fathers did in one crucial respect. All men, said Jefferson, are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. A statement that formally ties individual rights to the belief in God. Despite Jefferson's eminence, however, his statement, along with its counterparts in Locke, is intellectually unwarranted. The doctrine of individual rights does not derive from or depend on the idea of God as man's creator. It derives from the very nature of man and the requirements of his mind and his survival. In fact, as I have suggested, the concept of rights is ultimately incompatible with the idea of the supernatural. This is true not only logically, but also historically. Through all the centuries of the Middle Ages, there was plenty of belief in a creator. But only when that belief and religion as a whole began to fade did the idea of God as the author of individual rights emerge as a historical nation-shaping force. What then deserves the credit for the new development? The age-old belief or the new philosophy? What is the real intellectual root and protector of human liberty? God or reason? Now, my answer is now obvious. America, I hold, <coughs> does rest on a code of values and morality. This, the new right, is correct. But by all the evidence of philosophy and history, it does not rest on the values or ideas of religion. On the contrary, it rests on their opposite. Now let me touch on a new point. Some of you are probably wondering here, <clears throat> what about communism? Isn't it a logical, scientific, atheistic philosophy, and yet doesn't it lead straight to totalitarianism? <clears throat> the short answer to this is, communism is not an expression of logic or science, but the exact opposite. Despite all its anti-religious posturings, communism is nothing but a modern derivative of religion. It agrees with the essence of religion on every key issue, then merely gives that essence a new outward veneer or cover-up. The communists reject Aristotelian logic and Western science in favor of the so-called dialectic process. Reality, they claim, is a stream of outright contradictions, which is beyond the power of bourgeois reason to understand. The communists deny the very existence of man's mind, claiming that human words and actions reflect nothing but the alogical, predetermined churnings of blind matter. They do reject God, but they hasten to replace him with a secular stand-in, society or the state which they treat not as an aggregate of individuals, but as an unperceivable, omnipotent, supernatural organism, transcending and dwarfing all individuals. Man, they say, is a mere social cog or atom, whose duty is to sacrifice everything to and for his transcendent master, the state. Above all, they say, no such cog has the right to think by and for himself. 
Every man must accept the decrees of society's leaders. He must accept them because that is the voice of society, whether he understands it or not. In other words, communism fully, as much as Tertullian, demands faith from its followers and subjects. Faith in the literal religious sense of the term. On every count, the conclusion is the same. Communism is not a new rational philosophy. It is a tired, slavishly imitative air of religion. And this, by the way, <clears throat> is why so far communism cannot come to power in the West. Unlike the Russians, we have not been steeped enough in religion, in faith, sacrifice, humility, and therefore in servility. We are still, even now, too rational, too this worldly, and too individualistic to submit to naked tyranny. In other words, we are still being protected by the fading remnants of our Enlightenment heritage. But we will not be so for long if the new right has its way. Philosophically, the new right has the same fundamental ideas as the new left. Its religious zeal is merely a variant of irrationalism and the demand for self-sacrifice. And therefore, it has to lead to the same kind of results in practice, namely dictatorship. Nor is this merely my theoretical deduction. The new rightists themselves tell it to you openly. While claiming to be the defenders of Americanism, their distinctive political agenda is pure statism. The outstanding example of this is their insistence that the state prohibit abortion even in the first trimester. A woman in this view has no right to her own body or even the most consistent new rightists add to her own life. She should be made to sacrifice to sacrifice her desires, her life goals, and even her very existence at the behest of the state in the name of a mass of protoplasm, which is at most a potential human being, not an actual one. Another example, men and women, the new right tells us, should not be free to conduct their sexual or romantic lives in private. In accordance with their own choice and values, the law should prohibit any sexual practices condemned by religion. And children, we're told, should be indoctrinated by state-mandated religion at school. For instance, biology texts should be rewritten under government tutelage to present the book of Genesis as a scientific theory on a par with or even superior to the theory of evolution. And of course, the ritual of prayer must be forced down the children's throats. Is this not contrary to the Constitution, a state establishment of religion? You may ask, and of a controversial intellectual viewpoint? Not at all, says Jack Kemp. I quote from him. If a prayer is said aloud, it need be no more than a general acknowledgement of the existence, power, authority, and love of God the Creator, unquote. That's all. There's nothing controversial or indoctrinating about that. <laughs> and when the students finally do leave school, after all the indoctrination, can they then be trusted to deal with intellectual matters responsibly? No, says the new right. Adults, adults should not be free to write, to publish, or to read according to their own judgment. Literature should be censored by the state according to a religious standard of what is fitting as against obscene. Is this a movement in behalf of Americanism and individual rights? Is it even a movement in accordance with the principles of the Constitution? I quote Mr. Kemp, quote, The Constitution establishes freedom for religion, not from it, unquote a sentiment which is shared explicitly by President Reagan and by the whole New Right. What then becomes of intellectual freedom? 
are meetings such as this evening's, for instance, deprived of constitutional protection? Because the viewpoint I am propounding certainly does not come under freedom for religion. And what if one religious sect concludes that the statements of another are subversive of true religion? Who then decides which, if either, should be struck down according to the standard of freedom for religion, not from it? Can you predict the fate of free thought and of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness if Mr. Kemp and associates were to get their hands fully on the courts and the Congress? What we are seeing is the medievalism of the Puritans over again, but without their excuse of ignorance. We are seeing it on the part of modern Americans who live not before the Founding Fathers' heroic experiment in liberty, but after it. The new right is not the voice of Americanism. It is the voice of thought control attempting to take over in this country and pervert and undo the actual American Revolution. But you may say, aren't these new rightists at least champions of property rights and capitalism as against the economic statism of the liberals? To which I reply, no, they are not. Capitalism is the separation of state and economics a condition which none of our current politicians or pressure groups even dreams of advocating. The new right, like all the rest on the political scene today, accepts the welfare state mixed economy created by the New Deal and its heirs. Our conservatives now merely haggle on the system's fringes about a particular regu regulation or handout they happen to dislike. In this matter, the new right is moved solely by the power of tradition. It does not want to achieve any change of basic course, but merely to slow down the march to socialism and freeze the economic status quo. And even in regard to this highly limited goal, it is disarmed and useless. If you want to know why, I refer you to the published first drafts of the recent pastoral letter of the United States Catholic bishops men who are much more consistent and philosophical than anyone in the new right. The bishops recommend a giant step in the direction of socialism. They ask for a vast new government presence in our economic life, overseeing a vast new redistribution of wealth in order to aid the poor at home and abroad. <clears throat> and they ask for it on a single basic ground, consistency with the teachings of Christianity. Some of you may say here, but if the bishops are concerned with the poor, why don't they praise and recommend capitalism, the great historical engine of productivity, which makes everyone richer? If you think about it, however, you will see that valid as this point may be, the bishops cannot accept it. Can they praise the profit motive while extolling selflessness? Can they glorify the passion to own material property while declaring that worldly possessions are not important? Can they demand that men practice the virtues of productiveness and long-range planning while upholding as our model the lilies of the field? Can they endorse the self-assertive risk-taking of the entrepreneur while teaching that the meek shall inherit the earth? Can they unleash the creative ingenuity of the human mind, which is the real source of material wealth, while elevating faith above reason? The answers are obvious. Regardless of the unthinking pretenses of the new right, no religion, no religion by its nature can appeal to or admire the capitalist system, not if the religion is true to itself nor can any religion liberate man's power to create new wealth. If, therefore, the faithful are concerned about poverty, as the Bible demands they be, they have no alternative 
but to counsel a redistri redistribution of whatever wealth already happens to exist. The goods they have to say are here. How did they get here? God, they reply, has seen to that. Now let men make sure that they are distributed fairly. Or as the bishops put it, quote, the goods of this earth are common property, and men and women are summoned to faithful stewardship rather than to selfish appropriation or exploitation of what was destined for all, unquote. For further details on this point, I refer you to the bishop's letter. Given their premises, their argument is unanswerable. If, as the new right claims, there is scriptural warrant for state control of men's sexual activities, then there is surely much more such warrant for state control of men's economic activities. The idea of the Bible, or the Protestant ethic, as the base of capitalism, in other words, is ludicrous, both logically and historically. Economically, as in all other respects, the new right is leading us, admittedly or not, to the same end as its liberal opponents. By virtue of its essential premises, it is supporting and abetting the triumph of statism in this country, and therefore of communism in the world at large. When a free nation betrays its own heritage, it has no heart left no conviction by means of which to stand up to foreign aggressors. There was a flaw in the intellectual foundations of America from the start. The attempt to combine the Enlightenment approach in politics with the Judeo-Christian ethics. For a while, the latter element under the impact of the 18th century spirit was on the defensive, so that America could gain a foothold, grow to maturity and become great, but only for a while. Thanks to Immanuel Kant, as I have discussed in my book, The Ominous Parallels, the base of religion, in other words, faith and self-sacrifice, was unleashed again at the turn of the 19th century. Thereafter, all of modern philosophy embraced collectivism in the form of socialism, fascism, communism, welfare statism. By now, the distinctive ideas at the base of America have been largely forgotten or swept aside. They will not be brought back by an appeal to religion. What then is the solution? It is not atheism as such, and I say this even though as an objectivist, I am an atheist. Atheism is a negative. It means not believing in God which leaves wide open what you do believe in. It is futile to crusade for a negative. The communists, too, call themselves atheists. Nor is the answer secular humanism, about which we hear so much today. This term is used so loosely that it is essentially contentless. It is compatible with a huge range of conflicting viewpoints, including, again, communism. To combat the doctrines that are destroying our country, out of context terms and ideas such as these are useless. What we need is a specific, consistent philosophy in every branch, and especially in the two most important ones, epistemology and ethics. We need a philosophy of reason and rational self-interest, a philosophy which would once again release the power of man's mind and the energy inherent in his pursuit of happiness. Nothing less will save America or individual rights. There are many good people in the world who accept religion, and many of them hold some good ideas on social questions. I do not dispute any of that. But their religion is not the solution to our problem. It is the problem. Do I say that, therefore, there should now only be freedom for atheism? No, I am not, Mr. Kemp. Of course religions must be left free. No philosophic viewpoint, right or wrong, should be interfered with by the state. I do say, however, that it is time for patriots to take a stand, to name publicly what America does depend on and why it is not Judaism or Christianity. 
There are men today who advocate freedom and who recognize what ideas lie at its base, but who then go on to counsel practicality. It's too late, they say, to educate people philosophically. We must appeal to what they already believe. We must pretend to endorse religion on strategic grounds, even if privately we don't. This is a council of intellectual dishonesty and of utter impracticality. It is too late indeed, far too late for a strategy of deception, which by its nature has to backfire and always has, because it consists of sanctioning and supporting the very ideas that have to be exposed and uprooted. If you agree with my analysis this evening, then I say it is time to tell people the unvarnished truth, to stand up for reason and against any aversion of faith or mysticism. It is time to tell people, in logic, you cannot have both. It is unreason, one form of which is religion, versus America. Take your pick. If there is to be any chance for the future, this is the only chance there is. Thank you. Dr. Peikoff, on behalf of the Ford Hall Forum, we want to thank you for your excellent presentation. As with all of our speakers at the Ford Hall Forum, Dr. Peikoff has agreed to answer questions from our audience. Under our procedures, I will call on those of you who raise your hands moving from my left to my right, and I will repeat the question for the benefit of our audience here and for our radio audience. For my benefit and for the benefit of the audience here, would you please keep your questions brief? <clears throat> Question is, what is the alternative to Reagan? I could tell you very easily what the alternative is. I wish I could tell you who. <laughs> the, the alternative to Reagan would be at minimum somebody who did not attempt to hitch his bandwagon to the new right or to the philosophy of religion. Someone who counted on whatever fading remnants of the old American heritage are still left in the culture. Something like Reagan was when he spoke for Goldwater before he had presidential aspirations and became a professional religionist. But if you ask me who today would qualify as that, there is nobody. I can only say the last candidate that Ayn Rand voted for happily, although not that she was in by any means agreement with him, but at least she didn't shudder at the prospect, was Gerald Ford. But uh, primarily because he did not stand for a great deal. <laughs> The questioner asks whether, since in Scandinavia they have institutionalized religion, whether you view that as an example of what the new right would like to accomplish in America. I do not know the situation of religion in Scandinavia. I don't understand your reference to kings. Is that an analogy uh, or what? In what way is religion instituted? I would be surprised if you mean Sweden. Uh, because they're pretty left, and usually that goes with not being too explicitly religious, but I do not know the situation, so I can't comment. During this part of the question and answer period, there was a short period of technical difficulty experienced. The questioner asks, if I can recall the four, uh, who do you consider the most dangerous? Jesse Jackson, Louis Farrakhan, uh, the new right, and the fourth was? I'm sorry? 
and the Catholic bishops. Who is the most dangerous? Who is the most dangerous? And, and who is the least? Well, I don't have an enemies list with rankings. But my criterion of danger is philosophical. The more philosophical a man is on the wrong premises, assuming he has some influence, the more dangerous I regard him because I believe that philosophy is what shapes the course of history. Therefore, it's self-evident on the list you gave that the Catholic bishops are the most dangerous. They are by far the most philosophical of the people you mentioned. Most of the others probably couldn't spell philosophy. <laughs> Uh, a demagogue, which is what uh, Farrakhan and Jesse Jackson is, is no danger at all to a country that is philosophically armed. And when the country is philosophically disarmed, it makes no difference because there are so many hundreds of demagogues. You better run rather than waste time counting who is worse or who is better. So the issue comes down to who's most philosophical, and certainly uh, the Catholic Church is the most philosophical, religion in history, which is the one reason why I respect it more than any other religion and fear it more for the same reason. Questioner asks for your opinion on the recent military action taken by the United States against Libya, and secondly, what, in your opinion, would be the best course of action or strategy for dealing with terrorism? If someone dropped a bomb on Berlin under the Nazis. I would take it as self-evident that the only question at issue is, why did he not drop more? And that is exactly my attitude toward Libya. The grave flaw of Mr. Reagan is that, like everything else, he came back with a, quote, measured, moderate, diplomatic, inoffensive, middle-of-the-road, pragmatist response. He waited until I don't know how many people were killed and shot, drowned, and whatever else took place. He consulted with every ally until they finally all left town. And then when there was nothing whatever left to do, he got a few weak bombs and dropped them. And is now apparently trying to smooth things over. Now, it is not up to me to make foreign policy. It is very easy for a speaker on a podium to say what he would do. I know what I would do, but I'm not going to say it. But it would certainly not leave any question of whether Mr. Gaddafi is still alive after it was over. <laughs> Now, more broadly, what you can do with terrorists, you cannot do anything with terrorists if you yourself are having summit meetings with their sponsors. Obviously, the only thing that could be done is to break off relations with Soviet Russia, diplomatic, economic, and every other kind. That would in itself save the world and change the entire direction of our policy, petrify the hand-wringing Europeans, 
turn the Soviets explicitly into the craven thugs that they actually are and give us a chance, but that could not be done except by someone who believes that it is evil to turn the other cheek, that if someone slaps you once, you should not turn it 490 times more, <laughs> that if he takes your coat, you should retrieve it and not give him your cloak also. In other words, in foreign policy, as in domestic policy, this country cannot survive on the teachings of the scripture. And our foreign policy is a tremendous example, as bad as our economic policy, of where the Bible has brought us. Thank you. Speaker asks. <laughs> Dr. Peekoff to comment upon the fact that the universe, universalist, uni, Unitarian Universalists, pardon me, have produced many great thinkers and great persons throughout the years, including Thomas Jefferson, and that. As a religion, they are devoted to the search for truth. Every religion has produced great people because everybody so far has been religious. So the question is only are they religious because of or despite? Uh, are they great because of or despite their religion? The one you mentioned, I, I like to remain on a high plane of discussing only philosophy and religion in a broad sense and not go to a particular denomination, but since you mention it, I'll have to tell you my own ignorant understanding of Unitarianism, which might explain why, if you're correct, uh, why your, your particular creed has so many distinguished uh, children. I once uh, spoke, uh, worked actually for a man who was a Unitarian, a professor of philosophy in Denver. And I asked him to explain to me what Unitarianism was. And he said, well, best way I can tell you is when I went the first week, the uh, minister gave a sermon that, to the effect that there is no God. When I went the second week, he gave a sermon to the effect of the evil of faith. And when I went the third week, he said, we're going to have an open discussion. Where do we go from here? <laughs> In other words, Unitarianism, I do not regard as a real religion in the sense that I was defining it. It's an attenuated uh, form of philosophy that uh, is somewhere, it's like soft atheism. Uh, as I understand it, now I hasten to say there may be many versions of it that I do not know, but that's the best in my understanding. Philosophy, if I can just summarize, philosophy is not synonymous with religion. Any belief in a code of values, a view of life, is not synonymous with religion. I tried to define what I meant by religion. And the essence of it is faith, supernaturalism, and self-sacrifice. Anything less than that, I do not regard as a real religion. Why is that not no solution? Questioner asks, why is agnosticism no solution? If atheism is no solution, agnosticism is one step less than that. The atheist at least says there is no God. The agnostic's contribution to the question is, who knows? 
I don't know of any issue in the world that is important, that is advanced by people saying, my view of it is I haven't any idea. <laughs> Agnosticism I do not regard as a reputable position. It's appropriate if you're in your teens, you have not yet studied the question. If you've taken a couple courses in philosophy and you still don't know, then I would say you have a serious question to ask yourself. Why not? What is preventing someone from deciding this question? It's cut and dry. The arguments that have ever been offered in the entire history of thought are sold in paperback at every bookstore. Uh, every consideration that would be required to reach a judgment is there. And if you don't reach one, to me there's no basis uh, for such a thing as agnosticism. And here I may make the point that the onus of proof is on he who asserts the positive. If someone says there is a convention of gremlins at this moment studying Hegel on Venus, <laughs> I do not consider that it is reputable to say, I don't know, maybe. The next questioner asked how the new right uh, defends their stand on capitalism. Uh, <clears throat> I would suggest if you want to see what a new right attempt at defending capitalism is, read anything by a man called George David Stockman and Ronald Reagan. And his argument, he has a whole book, I can't remember the title of it, but it was a bestseller. Uh, and uh, a few years back, and um, his argument was that the capitalism rests on faith, self-sacrifice, and that a capitalist is a man who does not demand evidence, who does things blindly, and harms himself for the sake of others because he realizes that in the end, all of our minds are merely drops lost in the infinity which is God and that individuality is really unreal. This is interspersed with political polemic in favor of a particular law uh, cutting one regulation by one-tenth. Uh, this is uh, the, considered to be the most philosophic defense by the new right of capitalism. I think it's beneath discussion. What is an individual to do to stem the, the tide of mysticism on society? Well, I could say that an individual can't do anything because no one person can change the course of history. On the other hand, I could say an individual has to do everything because that's all there is. There is no such thing as society. So it comes down to this. I do not believe I would be inconsistent if I preached egoism and told you to sacrifice your own desires and become a crusader for a cause that you don't believe in. But if you do agree with what I was saying, with Ayn Rand, and you do want to make a change in the world, the only thing you can do is fight educationally. Don't worry about politics, because there's nothing you can do directly on politics. Politics is a consequence. They could not have the American Revolution before they had John Locke and all of his heirs to create the intellectual climate. And we're never going to have a second American Revolution until the universities change. And the universities cannot change until the philosophy departments do. So if you have any influence, any voice, any money, Put it where it will fight the philosophy departments and give someone who has a half-decent brain a chance to get in. And the, the, the sign of success will be if some of these institutions are in Boston, which shall be nameless, <laughs> were to give one out of a hundred faculty slots to somebody who advocated something other than what is now being advocated, that would be enough and the world would be safe. But the problem is, they will not do it. That's what an individual can do if you can do it. Thank you all very much. Thank you.